Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fans in Motion podcast, the one place on the internet for your hot Night Ranger talk. <laughs> <laughs> you're tired? <laughs> hey, can I have your thoughts? <laughs> okay. you're, you're hot. We're keep... You're hot Night Ranger. T- hot. I say that with all seriousness. You guys don't know what you're laughing about. I thought you said tots. <laughs> Night talk. Ranger tots. Night Ranger tots and talk. I'll take that. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fans in Motion podcast, the podcast that you didn't know you needed. I say to you, fools remain, but nothing gold can stay. All that glitters seems to blow away. Pleasure came and caused me all of this pain. Left me standing in the pouring rain. Say hello, Josh. Hey, we are here for all of your hot Night Ranger talk. Where else in the world can you go and get hot Night Ranger talk? Brent, what do you know about hot, hot, hot? I know that, um, I know that, um, <laughs> he's laughing. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh because see what y'all don't know is we've already done this cold opening one other time or probably what? this hot opening. What do you mean? And, yeah. Yeah. And Andy, Andy started it out with this hot pot and we all just died laughing. So that's where the hotness comes from. Well, as I You're... stated, and, and I'll stand by my comment. Where else in the World Wide Web can you go for all this hot Night Ranger conversation? Thank Nowhere you. but the Fans in Motion podcast. We're the number one Fans in Motion podcast. I'd say the number one downloaded exclusively Night Ranger podcast. I mean, that little niche, man, we, we got it. I'm not yeah, even sure so. for the number one podcast on our own website. Um, <laughs> but I digress. Uh, Andrew? So we are here. Um, we're the this, big. Uh, we're the big lots version. <laughs> Ollie's. Ooh. Ollie's outlet. Think... Yeah. So we're here. Uh, this is uh, the Gary Moon episode number three. Uh, that's what we're introducing on this one. Uh, I wasn't part of this podcast. I had to, uh, you know, Yay! the job thing. The job thing gets in the way. So I'm here for the intro, and I'll be here for the end of the show. But uh, I'm sure the podcast went swimmingly without me butting in and asking Gary deep questions about what venues he played in Cincinnati. How'd it go, guys? Went great. Uh, there was some... <clears throat> you know, Hold tech... on. You went a little quick with the went great. You could have well, went, we well, went you. great. Been... There, when you watch it, there's going to be some cuts and stuff because there was some technical issues with phones and we had he's on his phone charge, charging and everything. But uh, and We had a few lunar problems. <laughs> But, uh, uh, but yeah, in this episode, we touched a lot of his solo career after Night Ranger, and we touch on some of his other projects that he's done since the uh, Mojo era. But we spent a lot of time, again, touching, going back and discussing his time in the band, and we, you know, we we spent a lot of time talking about the um, the album. That he's recording with Brad right now on Brad's solo album. So he, we dig. Yeah, that deep, was really cool. <clears throat> we dig deep into it, and we we're all over the place on this. I mean, it was some great yeah. stories. He uh, we he t- tells us some great stories about uh, his first rock concert, oh, and nice. uh, he has a great Rubicon story as well. Yes, so, he does. Oh, that's cool. Well, I can't wait and... to watch this. First impressions of Brad and Kelly. Yeah? Yeah. Meeting them for the first time and hearing Brad play for the first time and pretty cool stuff. Oh, that's going to be cool, man. I cannot wait to listen. Uh, I'll pull that up on my Apple podcast and uh, I will put it in my ears. You know, the great thing about Gary is is you just um, you, you feed him a question. He feeds off the mojo. <laughs> it just keeps going. Yeah, I mean, literally, you just let the guy talk, and um, that story is going to go somewhere, and then it gets somewhere, and then it goes somewhere completely different. Right. Um, but it's so cool how you end up where you end up, you know. Yeah. I hope that sounds right. 
I like your little feeding off the mojo drop. Um, yeah, that way. was just you know, that was spontaneous. I uh, I write like that in my head, you know, as I'm talking. I'm writing right now. Put it out there to you, Brent. If I give you five bucks, if you can name the lyric I open the show with, name the song. I'm pretty sure you can't. Josh probably could. We should make it a contest. Whoever can name that lyric, Brent will do their name. <laughs> oh, will I? <laughs> Nah, I wouldn't put you under that pressure, man. I wouldn't do that to you. That was a song called "Last Chance" off the Feeding Off the Mojo album. For those I that knew that, I knew that, I knew, I knew that. So uh, I, I didn't know that was a song, but I know that song. It's a, it's another, it's a good tune. Um, you yes, know, I've it been, is. Since Gary has been um, gracious enough to sit and talk with us, I've gone back and really revisited that album, which you know was never really a favorite of mine. But I, I listened to it, and it's uh, it, it's really grown on me. Some really good tunes on there. So, because uh, I like Gary, I think Gary's just a cool guy. So it's like I maybe I missed uh, gotta judge that album too quickly. See, it's funny that you brought that up because Josh and I were talking about how fans are going back and rediscovering that album since we've been talking to him. Yeah. So, I hope pretty are. cool. I mean, anything in positive in the Night Ranger world is all right by me. And you're always um, and you're always going to have that. I don't know if backlash is the right word, but every band, when they change a member, especially a vocalist, a singer, it, they don't gravitate to it just because of reasons outside of the music. Just it's not what they're used to. So, and I got this scratchy voice now because of your damn <laughs> opening. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then we will, I'll do as much talking as I can and give you a break. But I have to ask you on this one: thoughts on the previous episode? Is there anything you want to bring up? Well, you know, we've got we've gotten a lot of positive uh, feedback from the uh, some hot feedback. Yeah, from the the second right when you said hot, I felt my throat there scratch up. Uh, but uh, yeah, just a lot of great feedback. People will really enjoy. I think it's opening way way I get it's opening up kind of a you know, this world to Gary that people just didn't know because there's not a lot of interviews out there absolutely that you can watch or listen to just because it's pre-internet when he was in the band. So they're learning a lot of stuff. And the second episode was uh, focused a lot around Night Ranger. <clears throat> so obviously that draws a lot of attention as well. But a lot of a lot of good feedback on it. Yeah, I think I told you, Josh, and I meant to forward them to you for this uh, interview with Gary, and um, I didn't. But a friend of the show, a friend of ours, Kevin Hayes, had um, he was listening to the episode where, where Gary was talking about playing uh, the club down in Clifton, Brent. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but Kevin knew who, which club it was, and that was what became Burgundy's. I think you and I, I think you brought that up. Yeah. Uh, but he, Kevin went up and found actual old photos of the club, and I will, uh, I will post them to the page. Uh, after we're done with this stuff, and I have some pictures of um, our chance scene of uh, the Gary Moon era of Night Ranger from Coyotes that I will also post to the page. So, I um, spent many of a Wallflowers nights in Burgundies. Yeah, <laughs> back when I was young and out of my element, trying to figure out what, what my element was. It but was not really, Burgundies. It, it wasn't Burgundies. It was not the University of Cincinnati main campus. I remember. I drug Tom Peacock. Yeah. Yes, his name is Peacock. I drug him to that bar like on a Thursday night. And there were, there was me and whoever was friends of that band that was playing there that night. It was normally a dance club, but they had actually had a rock band playing there. And this is circa 1989, 90. Sweet. And this band is playing, and now all of a sudden they go into Kiss Love or All I Can. Wow. Well, we're the only two people outside of the friends that are there, and we're going ape shit. Yeah. Because nobody's playing Love or All I Can in 1989, 1990, you know. Kiss so, doesn't even play that song anymore. No, well, not since 2004, so. <laughs> so anyway, there, there's your Burgundy story for all you people who don't know what Burgundy's was. That was where you went to check out the ladies, ladies, ladies. <laughs> yeah, then we graduated to Caddies <laughs> and Sleep Out Louie's and the Hurricane Surf Club <laughs> in Cincinnati. Yeah, I mean, the Hurricane Surf Club. Brett and I never really graduated to a lot of the ladies, 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 but we sure went out and had a good time. So, um, 
Andy Brett, let's move on. To, how dare you, sir? <laughs> how dare you? Yeah. Um, you want to? Uh, do you get any Night Ranger news you want to bring up and talk to us about? Do I have any Night? Is Ranger there anything news? going on in the Night Ranger world that we can talk about? I mean, Night Josh... Ranger is currently recording a new album, as we've been oh. stating, and and um, a good friend of the show, Eric Levy, is busy at recording some keyboard parts, and that's all I know. All right, Josh. I don't know if there's uh, anything else you can add to that. Well, they, more uh, shows. Oh, sorry, they, they uh, a show just went on sale today. Uh, it's a new show, not something that's been rescheduled. July 10th in Wabash, Indiana at the Honeywell Center. Um, I did purchase tickets today and got front row. For me and Brent, too? Negative. They're, they're $100 a piece. Um, front row. Yeah, so the uh, like I said, tickets went on sale today. Um, I will be there. I got two front row tickets. Uh, the first, I think, eight rows were 100 bucks, and then the all the middle sections, maybe 45 49 and then maybe the top four or five rows are 35 I saw Night Ranger there 2004 with uh, original lineup minus fits. It had uh, Michael Lardy was in the group. Jeff Watson was still there. It's a... It's a it's a good venue. I've been there twice. Like I said, I saw Night Ranger there. Then two thousand. Is that what the, you were referring to? That that extended version CD cover was from that show. Yes. Uh, okay. I don't remember who took the photos, but those photos, there's a set of them, all ended up on the internet. So I don't even know if the extended versions people even paid that person. I guess you have to see if there's a photography credit. But it's from that show. Everything was. And there's there's four. If you look right in the very front, up against the stage, there's four girls standing there. Those four girls were there. They you know all the same outfits. Jeff has these bell bottoms, these black velvet bell bottoms. So there was just you could just I just knew it was that Wabash show I was at. Uh, it's a pretty big venue. It's a nice venue. Um, Whereabouts in Indiana is that? <clears throat> it's a little bit north, I think, like a Muncie. Which is again north? It'd be like northwest of Indianapolis. Okay. Um, it's a uh, war. It's a little bit right around Warsaw, and then, but it's not as isolated as Shipshwana. Shipshwana is all the way up north right. uh, in the northeast section. This is a little bit below it. Uh, so <clears throat> in Wabash, you got you got like old downtown like probably like a lot of cities around the United States there's an old downtown area then there's kind of a section on the outside of town that's kind of like populated up now has all the restaurants and hotels this is like an event center it's called the Honeywell Center it's downtown and it's an old downtown so it's all the old buildings and everything and yeah. there's not a lot down there but uh and again I haven't been there since like I said I went in 2014 and saw Ronnie Millsap Rock and roll, um, but uh, he didn't see you though. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that one before. Uh, but, uh, um, he kept waving. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so when if you go, if you're going to go the, right next, there's only one hotel really downtown. Uh, it's a block away from the venue. It's a nice hotel. It's older, but it's very nice. Called the Charlie Creek Inn. Uh, usually 150 bucks a night, something like that. But it's really nice since within walking distance. If you're going to stay down at the, you know, the down the uh, the populated part, you know, your days in and all that stuff, it's going to be a little bit of a drive. So if you're going to be drinking, you know, you might want to yeah think about that. Pay the extra money and stay at the Charlie Creek Hotel, but it is a nice hotel. Uh, there is some bars that are out, you know, around it. Again, they're, you know, they're not just your neighborhood type bars that are around there. So um, it's a very good uh, venue and hopefully, I, hopefully, you know, come July 10th, we're not dealing with all the, you yeah. know, the yeah, stuff I hope it's not canceled. And hopefully if anybody is going to be at the I, show, look Josh up. I got a plan, Andy. What's up, buddy? It's, a, it's on a Saturday. Yeah. So you come up, pick me up. We go together. Then I help drive back. Yeah, and if we got, you know, and then I'll wake wanna, up. 
Yeah, if you want to touch my leg or something, I'll let you touch my leg, but that's it. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, but, um, because I work in retail, I'd be working every Saturday and Sunday. So. Well, yeah, but by by come come July, they should like you enough to where they like Andy yeah. take the weekend off. Go see Night uh, Ranger. Right, I'll let you know if that happens. Go see the Night Riders. Yeah, the Night Riders. <laughs> and um, you know, so we'll all three be there. We'll all sneak down to Josh's front row. There oh, you go. Hell yes. Like, what's up, Josh? The uh, word. And there's like 45 bucks, bitch. (laughs) There is not a bad seat in the venue. I mean, it's like I said, it's a big event center. The auditorium is just one small section to the place. So I'm going to roadie for Eric that night. There you go. That's your move. That's both of our moves. We're going to do it. We're going to carry his keys on stage on July 10th. Yeah. Yeah. You you better you better figure that out. Let's move on. Does anybody any New stuff, not music. Right. New stuff that they want to talk about: collectibles, purchases they may have made. Josh I have astounded right I've now. Been oh, wrapping yeah. gifts and making uh, <laughs> cookies. <coughs> I do not. I will uh, since he I get it right for this time, and you don't have anything to show. <laughs> no, I know, but uh, I do want to talk about. Uh, I have talked a few times about a venue called Tangiers in uh, Akron, Ohio. Yes. Uh, and I've always, if I talk to someone and they're going to be in Akron, I always tell them to uh, go check out that venue. It's it was it was a venue. Uh, it's kind of like it was a Las Vegas cabaret. It's something that the times have killed off all the other ones, and this one has survived. And it's in Akron, Ohio. It's this Vegas cabaret, but it's got this beautiful restaurant and it's got a grand ballroom for you know weddings and everything. I saw. Night Ranger there in the Mojo Tour in the summer. And I saw Shaw Blades there in 2007. I've seen David Allen Coe there and uh, numerous others, uh, Y&T there. And it's just great. It's a, It was just, I can't describe how unique and cool this is. If you get a chance, look up Tangiers and Akron, the website, or look at the photos and everything. Uh, and it was just bought out... And I got a great uh, – remind me sometime when we get to Shaw Blades, I'll tell you my uh, my chasing down Jack Blades um, story. I but... have some Shaw Blades questions, so we'll have to do a <laughs> side show about that. But uh, – the Lebr- and and, the, and if you get really – if you're into crime and all that stuff, it, it was like kind of like Italian mob kind of weaving stuff nice. into it as well. So there's a history to this building. Yeah, well, what was great about it is – so before – these acts like B.B. King and Tina Turner became legends. They were in that has-been category in the 70s, yeah. early 80s. Yeah. So in that Las Vegas cabaret in Akron, Ohio, they ho- Tina Turner played there. Uh, Fats Domino, Jerry Lee right. Lewis. Uh, and they got photos in this hallway, this long hallway of all these acts and everything. But B.B. Uh, yeah. King... They've got, they've got a place like that in Dayton, Ohio, too, where they used to have one in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Ray Charles. All these guys played there in the 70s and 80s. Anyways, um, I you'll hear me talking about it, but it is no bore. The uh, LeBron James Family Foundation bought the place, <clears throat> and I guess they've been trying to sell Tangiers for a while. But they bought it, and they're going to make this big community center out of it and everything. Oh, so. no. So it's not going to exist necessarily as a concert venue that we know of. No, and it, it's been headed that way for a while. I mean, every time I've gone up there recently, I've kind of, you know, you can kind of tell it's... See it. But, uh, I mean, what they've got planned for is really cool. I've seen, you know, the, like yeah. the press release, and it's going to be this big thing for the community. But, uh, yeah, Tangiers is no more. But uh, it's just some great rock history and Night Ranger <clears> and... <throat> Shaw Blades, you know, are a little part of that. So I just wanted Well, to... isn't that um, a similar... Well, not similar. I shouldn't say similar story, but uh, we're also losing or have lost the Al Rosa Villa. The Al, Rose, was sold, wasn't the it? Al Rosa Villa, which is a, a rock club in Columbus, Ohio, that everybody's played at, obviously now is more known for, you know, where Dimebag Daryl was murdered. Yes. So ever since that happened... Uh, there's a lot of acts that would not play there. Yeah. And on top of that, you know, the rock concert industry club level wise is obviously been decreasing. Um, 
So they were going to have their final concert there in May. And then obviously the pandemic happened. So, uh, yeah, they're looking to sell it. I don't know if they have yet, but yeah. uh, if, you know, the pandemic ends, then maybe they would still have. Well, I know because you had posted some pictures, uh, I think. <clears throat> Didn't you post some yeah. pictures from the Al Rosa? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and everybody's played. Everybody's played. I mean, if you're on your way up and on your way down, that's where you played the Al Rosa. A week before I saw Night Ranger, which is the some of the photos I was posting, I saw Ace Freely and Peter Chris there. Wow. So, yeah, they played there? Yeah. Dang. It wasn't even sold out. Uh, yeah, the Bad Boys tour. Yeah, but, you know, there was... December. God, that's... Oh, I didn't yeah. know of anywhere they were playing. Mm-hmm. Peter, yeah, Peter, no Peter, Chris played there in '94, um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, both you know, like I said, we're losing these venues, and I don't think it's COVID. These places were on yeah. the way out. COVID just kind of sped it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I had been to the, my one and only time being at the Al Rosa, which honestly, oddly enough, Brent is the uh, the night I was there was the night that me and um, my significant other. Um, started dating. I was up there to see a lynch mob and Mr. Big. Yeah. Well, yeah. fantastic, yeah. man. Guitar smoke flying off everybody's fingers. Yeah. The last time I was at the Al Rosa was to see Saigon Kick. I 19, was not there for that. 1995? Yeah, you weren't there for that. It was, oh, God, whenever, whenever they details? came. Or, yeah. Yeah, I was at that show. Uh, and the time before that was my boy's Lord Tracy. Did a whole Labor Day weekend there, and I went up and stayed with <laughs> with somebody that um, was staying at I uh, lived in Ohio State, and slept in this nasty ass house. Just so I wouldn't have to drive back and forth. And um, but Lord Tracy, if you don't know Lord Tracy, get to know Lord Tracy. Great well, band. Josh and I don't know if we've ever mentioned you're a Saigon Kick fan. Have we talked about that? I think maybe Bree and Brett have. I'm a Saigon Kick fan up to uh, Devil in the Details. After their yeah, st- you don't have Bastards? I do. That's why I don't go up to that. Well, Bastards is good. Uh, I'm I'm it's only Jason. Fan. I'm not a big well, fan. Say, are you a Kick fan or a Jason Bieler fan? I'm both. I, I didn't yeah. mind Water, Devil in the Details. Uh, I would say the album I probably got into most was actually Devil in the Details. Um, Water but, was really turned me on to him. Yeah. Brent, again, Brent had been on me to like listen to this band, and I, I, I put the water. We, I know we're going off topic here, but I got I put the water CD in, and it just really resonated with you. Really resonated with me. I was like, man, this is fantastic yeah. music. If you're looking for some good new music, uh, that's all over the place. Um, yeah. And the reason why we're talking about two different people was on their first two albums, you had uh, uh, Matt Kramer. Jason. Or Matt, 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 yeah, Matt Kramer was the singer. And then on the the next two albums, which is Water and Devil in the Details, you have the, uh, the whatever. But uh, you got uh, Jason Beeler, who was the guitarist singing, who's a very good vocalist as well. And they're known for Love is on the Way and All I Want. But they're so much more than that, kind of like Night Ranger. Um, and that's the, Matt Kramer singing Love is on the Way, the big hit. Yes. Uh, the Lizard... The, their lizard, which is their second album, is fantastic. All yeah. over the place, heavy. Oh, uh, the silly the song they put on fantastic. every. Yeah, I mean, song. I like the first album too, but uh, the, the lizard just stands out. And they then, are. Was they it are sentimental everything. Girlfriend? Is that the one I'm thinking of? Yeah, sentimental girlfriend, friends. Father was a victim of a failed romance. I mean, they always have kind of a silly little. Hit it. They're, hit it they're in the back make any sense to the Yeah, album. I mean they're they're Duke Ellington, they're the Beatles, they're Metallica, they're they're Kiss, they're Def Le- I mean every band and every, I mean they just when you think you've got them pinned, they, they come back with back some in. swing they got like a swing song, you know. It's yeah. a, it's it's amazing and it's good. All right, we'll have to save that for another conversation. We're go, doing uh, well. go dig up Saigon Kick Spanish Rain. Get yourself a Brent, little. you'll post oh, some Saigon tune. Kick to good the page. Tune. All right. What's uh, that? You post some Saigon Kick to the page when we get done. Uh, so, our buddy uh, Dave Nadelman, he went to school with Matt Kramer. Get out of here. No, he, we, had a, we had a discussion one night. So, yeah, he's very well versed well, cool. in Saigon Kick. So. Welcome to the right. hottest Night Ranger talk. 
along with some Saigon kick. With Saigon kick your ass in the, like in Night Ranger. I I, and and I always liked how they got their name. Saigon kick was uh, when they were trying to name it in the late '80s. One of them, or somehow, the conversation got that Hollywood was on a Saigon kick. You had all those movies, <laughs> Plut- Platoon and all that stuff, and Tora Duty was on you know TV and. So Sa- Saigon Kick, they like that, and that's how they got the name. Sounded good together. That's yeah. funny. That's great. Um, moving along, Brent, do you have any, or is anybody got any fans in motion news or topics we want to bring up? This Les week, Nesman? fans in motion news. Yeah. We've had some very good, very good posting indeed this week from our old buddy, Dwayne Night Duanger. Night Duanger, as his friends call him. He is out of Facebook jail, folks, and he is back strongly on the Fans in Motion page. Posting his... Here, let's cover up the screen so we can see what we're talking about here. It's yeah. Charlie Brown Tree with his Night his Night Duanger ornament. Is that so, something he has custom made, or were those available? I just didn't know about it. Those, those were on the website, I don't know, a year or two, five years, ten years. It's all the same to me anymore, but yes, those were available on the website at one time. Love it. So yeah, so we welcome him back. We're glad. I don't know why he was in Facebook jail. Well, welcome Probably. back, Dwayne. Yeah, welcome back, Dwayne. And we have our good. And we have <laughs> because this made me smile. The color of my smile. You like my DJ voice? Lance have, rushing. Lance rushing posted the color of your smile. Live and basically told Andy and I to check it out. And what I loved about the video, right when they start the song, you hear somebody in the audience, and it sounds like me. He said, "How can you not be happy to this song?" <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what I was saying to you before. The song makes me happy. And I cover was like, that up. Cover that up again, Brent. If you notice there, uh, I can't see it. So, yeah, cover it up. I can still see your face. I want, to, I want to talk about okay. something behind you. Oh, there, there we go. go. So you see all the likes down there. We have uh, the guitar player in my band, Bob Horton, is one of the people that like that. So uh, oh, shout out to my, uh, a, a good friend of mine and Brent's, Bob Horton there. Does Bob watch a show? Uh, I don't know if he watches, listens, or uh, he just likes them, the pages. I don't know. You can uncover. Go back to your news stories. Or is he All frozen right. up? Josh, it's, that's uh, dead hey, air. Hey, there we go. Bulgar. So uh, what else we got? Uh, I have, uh, if you, you guys... music. Are you still on Fans in Motion? Do you have something, Josh? I'm I sorry. I didn't mean to jump hey, over. I'm back. Are you, can you hear me? Yeah. Internet just went down. I said, is Bob Horton, does Bob Horton watch the show? I said I don't know. I mean, I, I think oh, if I... he does, he probably listens to it while he walks um, via uh, a pod, you know, I, 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 I tunes or something i don't know you know what i've learned all these songs to play in your band for him yeah i've learned them damn well better be listening to us bob horton the beard a legend in the cincinnati music scene it's a freaking awesome guitar player i tried to steal him after andy moved away and he rejected <laughs> me rejected he's loyal me like to nothing else Not to anyway <laughs> if you're much, what else you got right um, that's it. That's all I have in fans of motion news. Um, we had we did have a lot of people join this week. Josh, how many people signed up this week? About 15, 20 requested to be on the page? Oh, um, I don't know. I just push approve. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good number. It's steady. Uh, so we're closing in on 1,700 uh, faithful. So nice. I think they're that's all awesome. real. So. Yeah, even if they're Russian bots, we'll take it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, uh, do we I need used to do uh... my, my approval, my check to see if there's anything Night Ranger related? There's been a couple that aren't. So, and I always wonder what, you know, and you, and you never see their name pop up on anything again. So, Well, I mean, how many pages do we like and yeah. we don't comment on? I just look to see if they got photos and if they've been on facebook for a while so all good um do we even need to discuss new music since we just talked about saigon kick for 20 minutes you want nope, another hot we're good let's uh, let's kick? uh let's go ahead and everyone's already skipped to gary moon anyway so <laughs> let's uh 
go ahead and uh, jump into the, this week's episode. All right, everybody. Stay tuned. Watch the Gary Moon episode, and we'll see you on the backside. So Just run away It's lonely Welcome back to part three of our interview with Gary Moon, uh, former bassist, vocalist for Night Ranger on the Feeding Off the Mojo album. Gary, last time we talked to you, we uh, kind of uh, ended it with the Alligator record that you and Brad recorded in 2000. And we want, I wanted to pick up with the next thing that kind of comes along chronologically was... Um, was a 2001 album, that solo album that Kelly Kagi recorded, and you, re, you and him shared vocals and recorded a track called "Wrong Again," right. which was actually a one of the first songs that you guys kind of maybe put together for the uh, when you guys re, uh, got together in the early 90s, correct? Yeah, I think it was. Uh... Uh, you know, that was one one um, special thing that Brad had on his guitar where we'd use his volume control where he'd, he'd roll, roll it with his little finger. That's how he got that effect. Was, it sounded like it was coming in and out, in and out, you know. That's uh, the uh, intro part, right? Kind of? Yeah. Yeah. In the intro, yeah. But that was something he, he's used in the past. But uh, it was perfect for this song, so that that was a nice little uh, click there on on the record. Yeah, and it was like the first time we started harmonizing together, and and uh, we were very happy people at that point. <laughs> starting starting Night Ranger, getting them back on the road, and um, um, and you know, it just it just kept blossoming after that. Now, I mean. Like, we yeah. have a we have a listener, and he he specifically wanted me to talk to you about this song, Patrick Fitzgerald. Um, yeah. He, uh, I think this is probably one of his favorite tracks, and he specifically mentioned it. Now, when was this one? Of, was this a song that you brought to the band, or was this a song that uh, was written after you had joined? It was a song that uh, I think his buddy, uh, I think his name is Todd Meager. Um, he helped write, you know, a couple songs uh, and came up with it, a couple parts of songs mm -hmm. on the record, on his record, especially uh, Kelly's record. And and, and he, he was one of those really great songwriter guys that would come in and make a great song little better you know mm -hmm. so i think he had a lot to do with that song with kelly and then uh brad put his signature volume thing on there and then my voice just kelly kelly's voice and my voice together was just almost like a match made in heaven so i mean we, we always had to almost argue who's going to sing the high part who's going <laughs> to sing the low part yeah well, but, um, on the but he, uh, he's a he's a little more baritone than I am, so and I can reach those high notes with a a little switch that I hit on my my back, and all of a sudden I go up a register. Well, what was great is, especially on the demo version, Kelly sings the first verse, you sing the second verse, but behind the lead vocal, like on the first verse where Kelly's singing, you're right underneath him belting it out and then on the second verse where you're the lead vocal you can hear kelly right underneath you yeah. you know belting it out as well it was just uh one of those songs i think a lot of fans enjoyed and you know we're glad that it finally made it on a studio record it's just we kind of wish that 
that long lost Night Ranger demo of it would uh, would appear. Now, for a brief time, you worked with you were with a band, and I remember you talking previously that you never liked to be boxed into a certain type. Like you like to be free to do whatever type music that you know you enjoyed, and you were with a group called persons unknown right around 2003 and 2004. And, um, how did that come about? And is, is, was there ever an album released or anything like that? For those who have never heard it, I'll post a, uh, a clip of it. There was a song called, uh, I think warrior warrior, and Mm -hmm. you can find it out there on YouTube. And I don't know. I just, imagine you know if i was drinking heavily and thought i was a viking or something (laughs) um that is like the genre that it would fall under uh it took you there didn't it 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 did and it's unique and that's i think why i always i still gravitate to it um but uh how did boy uh... yeah just it's a very unique (laughs) thing how did how did that project come about and was there ever anything ever released like cd or anything like that from that group? Well, we recorded a, a bunch of demos that uh, basically were, you know, top quality recordings. Uh, I, what was is uh, we had this, our management company uh, with Night Ranger for a short time. There was another company that we used and uh there was a secretary there named Amanda, Amanda Forker. Uh, she was from England also. These guys were from England, by the way. Oh, really? They were, yeah. And these, they were like, you know, six, five. They all like probably weighed, I don't know, 300 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were warriors. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, when you see that video, you could see us holding big sticks, and walking in the dirt and uh but anyway uh, amanda they were getting ready to do some recordings and amanda has always been one of my favorite fans and she says i would like to see see what you could do with these guys maybe put because kevin drinkwater who was the lead singer he was a man of spoken word like you know poet Mm -hmm. and uh all of his lyrics if you if you just read he has a book out kevin drinkwater and um, if you read the lyrics, they're pretty bold, but they they were a little a little light on the music to go with it. Like we had uh, guy that played hand percussion, and uh, Rich who played guitar, acoustic guitar, and that was it. And then uh, Kevin with the vocal, and of course he he played uh, tambourine and maracas and all that kind of stuff. But it needed a little more music behind those words to make it uh, palatable, uh, palatable to, uh, you know, the industry. If they wanted to sign us up, they probably needed a little more than just darkness rolls across the sea, crawls across the sky, warriors of light reunite and set our planet free. It was that, you know, what are you going to do with that? I can put music to that, I think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but so so anyway, I went to they they actually were renting a studio that was pretty close to where I lived. So I just went over there one night. They were expecting me. They heard all my stuff and they were kind of excited about meeting me. They I mean, I they made it out that I was way bigger than I really was. But <laughs> but they heard my stuff and they were interested in um uh, allowing another person come in and, and see what we could gel up. And um, so, you know, I said, you know, I'm not really doing a whole lot right now. And, you know, I started going to three rehearsals a week and we started uh, trying to put together a little bit more music uh, behind those words because the, the lyrics were really fantastic. Um, and so I started playing with these guys and we started doing a couple shows in LA. 
um, just to see how it would go because they had a, a following already. They'd been playing as a trio. Uh, and uh, so I came in, played bass, and put in more vocals, and we arranged the songs to where there'd, there'd be a verse, you know, structured mm -hmm. it so it can actually be a song, you know, because sometimes it's uh, spoken word guys, you know, they, they go off left field for a reason because that's what the story asked for. Um, but we started c cutting it down to, you know, three to three to five minute songs and, uh, and people loved it. And so it, I wouldn't do anything else at the time. I mean, I was writing stuff, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I really enjoyed being one of the guys. I mean, these guys are like from Biddulph, England, which is like way north, way up just across from Scotland. Um, it's, they were primitive, really primitive up there. And you could tell when, you know, when I walked in that room that, holy shit, man, I got, I got, uh, I got some warriors here. I mean, I didn't even know, I didn't know there was a song called where, but they just looked like, like that. They, they were ready to kick somebody's ass. That's what it's like, but they, they were all lovey. They were all lovey dovey guys. And we hugged all the time. And, uh, it was a brethren kind of thing. And, and, uh, we got along great first night. I'll never forget it. It was like, man, are you, are you allowed to do this with us? I said, Hell yeah! I, I decided that I wanted to do it with you, and Amanda turned me on to you. Amanda was um, Kevin Drinkwater's uh, girlfriend for a little while, so they've stayed friends all those years. And uh, so she thought that Kevin and I would really hit it off. Mm -hmm. um, really, it was. I just felt like I was twelve, or no, more, more like nine. <laughs> and we became blood brothers. We cut our wrists put the blood together and rubbed them, you know, and hopefully it stopped bleeding. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we just felt like the, he showed up on his motorcycle that he actually built himself. His dad used to build motorcycles in England. So he took uh, so many parts and different bikes and he built his own bike. And that thing, he could, he could, run it in, in rodeos. I mean, he stood up with his hands out like this, going 60. I mean, he was, he was just a madman. I mean, he really was. I mean, yeah. oh, I don't know if you've ever seen any pictures. Did I send you any pictures? I think there, I have something I saved online. A, a few some, years. Sometimes he wears a helmet or, or motorcycle glasses on stage, and he always has a fucking six-foot sword that he did sword dances you know, in between songs. And uh, it always had some kind of fire behind us, you know. It was it was pretty dramatic. <laughs> so I, I was so lucky to be able to, to be with those guys until uh, Kevin, unfortunately, killed himself on his own bike, uh, driving around some of the, the hillsides up by where I lived up in the, the foothills above uh, Pasadena. Was was Persons Unknown still active when he passed away, or had it already dissolved before he passed away? Well, if you want to know the truth, he was Persons Unknown. Mm. I mean, it, it was his words, and these guys have been friends since they were kids. Mm. Uh, without Kevin's voice, it was yeah. There was just no reason to carry it on any further. It's almost like it's too good to do any with anything with. I mean, sometimes that's why a lot of groups, they don't do a new record because they thought that they hit their peak. And if they do a new record, maybe it wasn't as good as that peak. And then all of a sudden you're losing people. Mm -hmm. So, well, so we just, we ended on a, on a high note and, um, and I still listen to those songs. I mean, they're all uh, so inspiring. But anyway, that's my little story about persons I know. Well, I will post that link to the one song that's on YouTube, the video, so everyone can uh, kind of get a visual representation of what we've been talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Like I said, and you know what? I, I talked about 
drinking and being Vikings, and it makes sense that they're from England. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't too exactly. far off. Um, I want to jump over to uh, the the solo album that you released, um, Still Moon. Uh huh. Now that was basically the the recordings of the band before that you were in before you went to Night Ranger called The Pack with uh, Curly Smith and um, I think Pete Kamita from Cheap Trick you said was there and um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on some of the other names but so that was basically that album and and what did you do to release it under Still Moon did you re-record it Uh, Um, what we did as we were we had some of the the best people helping us uh, that just loved our music and loved all the the members of the band I mean fans were coming out of the woodwork because everybody was different we had the cheap trick we had a guy that's playing at, at from you know from Boston to this day and he was in Jojo Gun back in the the early days um and he'd done a whole bunch of records too. I mean, uh, he was on so many. I, you know, I don't even have a time to even mention. But he's like one of those guys that you bring in, mm-hmm. and and he he'll spark up one song. It could be like the first single. You know, he's like one of those kind of guys. And uh, great voice when he's playing drums. I mean, actually, I was turned on to Curly um, by Matt Sorum because I had Matt Sorum playing with. My little band, uh, let me get this off the screen here. Oh, lost you. You know, there was a time where, you know, I, I bought this building and turned it into a rehearsal studio and a recording studio, actually. And it was I had an apartment upstairs that was all one huge room and a big stage and a up on top in a, in a loft, I guess you could call it. I had a bed up there, so if we were recording or if I was rehearsing and I didn't want to go home, which is only four blocks away, <laughs> <laughs> I would just stay down there and have the time of my life. And uh, and uh, everybody thought that I was working on stuff, but really, no, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, when I was doing a, a Moon Sparks. Uh, trying to put a Moonspark show together. And I found Matt. Uh, he just was this studio guy, he just hopped, hopped around. He was like a one take guy. I mean, if you wanted a drummer, he was known around town as like, bring Matt in. We're having trouble with drums. And um, when he got with Gun and R- Guns N' Roses, they were having trouble with, uh, I think it was Steve Adler. Yeah. Um, and I think we talked about this before. A little bit, yeah. Um, I might have to plug my uh, power back in. But anyway. Uh, anyway, so uh, he played, Matt played with us, and we, we did a couple shows in L.A. Uh, these kind of theater, theater shows that, you know, they take these old theaters, maybe 1,200 seater or 1,500 seater, and the acoustics in there are so great. And uh, it has all that old architecture inside, mm-hmm. you know, dragons yeah. and gargoyles <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So it was just perfect. And uh, then when this opportunity came up to ask uh, Matt if he would help finish the illusion one and two record Mm -hmm. that they did. Yep. And, uh, so I said, man, do it. I mean, come on, you got, they're going to pay you. Right. I mean, we were just still putting things together. So it wasn't totally solid yet, but, but Matt's a a loyal guy and, uh, he didn't want to do it unless I would let him go, which is kind of interesting (laughs) because, If I was yeah. him, I would just say, hey, guys, I'm, I'm done with this. But uh, but he felt uh, very loyal to uh, to me and Sparks. And uh, so what happened was um, one of his mentors 
his favorite drummers of all time was guess who curly smith oh thought you were gonna say uh, me <laughs> well you know i just <laughs> i was gonna try to write some kind of a release form here <laughs> no <laughs> no um so you know what he did is he called he called uh curly and said that he's been working with me on this all this original music and stuff and he had an opportunity to play a show or two with the Guns N' Roses, or finish the record, yeah. basically. And um, and so all of a sudden, uh, Curly gave me a call and said, "Hey, uh, Matt told me about your situation, and I'm, I'm kind of down in San Diego way, but uh, if you want me to, I'll come up and I, I'd, I'd love to check it out because Matt." said highly of all your stuff and your voice, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I think you like playing with Gary. He's a bass player that picks up on the drums. And a lot of bass players just go off on their own. The drummer has to follow him. But I've always, I always wanted to be a drummer. So in other words, I was really trying to actually accent the drums with the drummer. You yeah. Know? So it slowed me down. I, I didn't get so busy. Because I used to be a busy bass player, came out from I studied jazz in in college, I played upright bass for a couple of years, and I was all over the neck because I was a guitar player first, you know. But uh, so Curly came in, and we started playing stuff. And uh, what happened was I, I had to dissolve the Moon Sparks thing uh, because it was getting too. Well, it took, it took too much work to do it. So I just put that on the shelf. And um, Kelly and I said, uh, I'm not, I say Kelly. Yeah. That was a, a Freudian slip there. Sorry, Kelly. But uh, I'm always thinking about you. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was like, uh, let's try to put something together. So I started writing some songs with uh, Stephen Isham from um, from Autograph uh, Autograph, thank you yep. and we, we were buddies because my my lady and his lady were ended up being good friends so we started hanging out together getting stoned together <laughs> drinking a lot of beer together going to bars together going back and writing stuff down we started writing songs so we had we had him on keyboards, me on bass, and uh, Curly happened to be available, and he liked the stuff. So he he came in and he brought in Pete Kamita because they were best friends, and it just fell together. And and uh, we thought, well, we're just a pack of wolves, you know. Let's call ourselves the pack, with the you know the the logo had a big claw mark from a wolf, you know. I thought that was kind of cool. So here we are, the pack now. And uh, there's a guy, uh, a producer, engineer guy named Toby Wright. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he did that with the chains, Kiss. Right. There you go. There you go. And he was one of my best friends. He just lived 10 minutes from me. And he liked our stuff, and so he wanted to get involved uh we didn't pay him nothing. Just went in the studio wherever he was working at the time. Uh, he made sure there was off time for whoever he was working with and bring us in. So we recorded all those songs on the Still Moon CD, plus a bunch more, but we chose those. Um, and then, of course, I, I got the opportunity to join Night Ranger. Um and nothing was happening yet with the pack, but we had all those songs recorded. I didn't know how it was going to work out with Night Ranger. You know, I never knew these guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never listened to top radio, top 40. Uh, I never heard of them. And uh, so it was kind of a blind thing that uh, I went into. And they, I, I know what it was. Uh, Kelly and Brad had been hearing 
some of my demos going around. And they liked uh, my bass playing and singing, which uh, would take the place of Jack Blake. And the, the management company, which I'm sure you know, um, was working with us at that time. Um, I can't think of his name now. Bruce Bird? Camel? Bruce Bird. Uh, Bruce Bird. Yep. Bruce Bird. Thank you. Bruce Bird. And um, Bruce Bird called me in. I met Brad and Kelly for the first time. And they said that uh, this is their situation. You never heard of Night Ranger. I know that. You never heard any of their music. But you know that their band is successful. And we want to bring you in if you're interested and be a third member of the band and try to bring Night Ranger back after they, they broke up because of their contract with Universal Records or something like that. The only way they could get out of the contract is to, um, you guys still with me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I am listening to, listening to it. I love hearing this story. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to, I'm going to finish that story, but I got to go plug my phone in. All right. Cause you guys are, are you look funny right now. I got that I need... perhaps we could do something to where the fans could pick the color of the next vinyl if they release one. You know, yeah, the... and maybe give them some insight of what the fans want. So maybe they could do a mojo. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Well, that would be awesome if if uh, get a re-release. I mean, that record really wasn't even released. It just we made this record, and then uh, they put us out on tour without backing us up with the CDs and all the record stores. And meet yeah. and greet stuff. And um, so uh, we never really got to promote that record the way it should have been promoted. I'm ready. Everybody loved the music <clears throat> and uh, the whole tour with the uh, uh, interviews on radio. You know, every time you go, you try to do a little radio in the late afternoon, the drive time, where you, you could suck a whole bunch of people into the show. You know, if you have 10, 20, 30,000 people. Uh, a lot of people just don't read the trades. Or, right. And it was a new record, and they haven't been playing any new stuff from them, uh, from Night Ranger. So, um, they weren't playing old stuff either at the time. I know. I yeah. know. So we were this Minnie Moe and Jack out there um, kicking ass as a trio. You know, a, a trio sometimes sounds harder. You know, with uh, Midnight Madness, you know, Night Ranger had a little bit more um, rock edge, I think you want to call it. I think, anyway. And that's one thing they wanted to bring back when Night Ranger came back together. They wanted to go back into the harder, you know, strong rock. Because um, everybody was trying to get them to do ballads, because mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where the money was at, you know? And they did good with ballads. There's no doubt about that. But they were trying to come back and be more guitar oriented, oriented than that. And my voice is a little stronger, you know, a rock voice kind of guy. Uh, and so it was, it was kind of fun to be in a situation where I'm helping a band get back out there. And then with the Mojo record, which wasn't well promoted, like I said, um, it was really hard. It's 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 kind of one one of those records that people are still finding mm -hmm. out the records out there. Mm -hmm. um, well, it'd be nice if uh, they would just you know with that record and like Seven and Neverland, you know, do a vinyl mm -hmm. release of those '90s records and. Someone owned, I don't know if it's Night Ranger. I mean, someone owns that uh, that master because this came out maybe 10 years ago, maybe not even that long. But you can see they licensed Night Ranger and then this Alternative, alternative Gotta Have It hits from 2000. That came mm -hmm. out in 2000. But then they, they licensed that to be put together. Like a compilation? Yeah, but now they use the... You know, it's it's two disc, 
Um, but yeah, they had to have licensed that. Is that from... Germany? No, it's United States. It's uh. Oh, is it really? Yeah, it it looks like I think the record label was Gusto. Um, they they own a lot of. You used to see them like in cheap music bins. Um, you know, discounted music. In the bargain bins, yeah. Well, it was kind of like uh, they were like usually like six ninety nine a CD, and a lot of country. Like I own some of them, uh, you know Johnny Rodriguez. You know, if you guys remember him and stuff. But uh, but yeah, this was. Uh, but it's not quite Gusto, but it's it's distributed by IMG Inc. out of Nashville, Tennessee. Maybe we can get Andy to work on it. But uh, but anyways, they had to have licensed this from. Uh, you know, either yeah. either Night Ranger or whoever. If I don't know if you guys owned that master, if if Drive Entertainment owned it, and then it was uh, absorbed by whoever eventually bought Drive, Drive. And, and so forth. But someone yeah, I owned... think it was Drive. I think it was Drive that had the masters. Yes. Um, I know that. I know that um, uh, David Prater, who was a producer. Uh, we did the record in, in Austin, Texas, and that's where he does his stuff. So we had to go out there mm-hmm. to him. Yeah. And uh, I don't, I don't know if he had any ownership at all, but I, I know that Drive well, was paying the bill, and uh, so who knows? Yeah, someone owns it because they let uh, this organization release it. Like I said, probably it's been within the last ten years. You know, I'd say 2010, 2012 yeah. is some time when that was started uh, showing up out there. So with, um, so you guys have that album or the that set of demos recorded for the pack, and then, you know, you take those demos and you you re-record them, or do you just, uh, you know, fancy them up a little bit and just kind of throw the Gary Moon Still Moon cover on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was um, so many, you know when I I we kind of had to dissolve because everybody was starting to go in their own different ways. But I thought the pack was we were like one of the best bands I think I've ever been with. Everybody was top of their game and we were all different and together it just it created those songs and um but uh, when i had an opportunity i mean we've been pl- we, were, we were playing all over the place uh mm-hmm. with the pack and we had uh ahmed erdogan from atlantic records fly out from new york see us in a, a big showcase that was all set up with a big stage and everything. And they were going to sign us almost immediately. Um, we had a whole bunch of things like that happening, right? Right. So close, but it all of a sudden the opportunity with night Ranger, uh, reared his head. And I go, if this, if the pack record does something, I'll, I'll jump over there and do that too. No big deal. I mean, the pack is like four guys, sometimes five guys that uh, were from different bands. It's almost like the Hitman All Stars mm-hmm. that I did with uh, Curly too. Um, and people liked everybody in the band separately from the music that they did on their own. And then you put us all together, and there's a whole two-hour show of all the mixture of songs. That's kind of exciting. Yep. Because I'm I'm singing, uh, you know, uh, Cheap Trick songs, which I loved. I mean, Cheap Trick was like one of my favorite bands. I, I loved the whole thing about those guys. And uh, but uh, so the pack uh, knew that I was gonna. I was very interested in joining Night Ranger, and I had to. I had to cut it loose. And Curly and I have been have been friends ever since. And uh, so, and, what else do you want to know? And, <laughs> and two of the well, if you're a fan of, I mean, if you're a fan of Night Ranger melodic rock, uh, I think this is a, it, both of these records we're going to talk about are available on Amazon. Um, just 
great, just a great melodic hard rock album. Two of the songs off the record uh, become Night Ranger tracks, Heart of Stone and mm-hmm. Music Box, which Music Box mm-hmm. eventually ending up on the Mojo record, though mm-hmm. in a different version. Uh, Heart of Stone was one of those early tracks that the Mojo era of Night Ranger played. I mean, if you saw them in 91, 92, 93, you were hearing Heart of Stone. But there's a lot of great tracks on there. Uh, I Always Like Queen of the Damned is a <laughs> great song. Um, but there's a lot of great tracks on there. And then a few years later, we get another Gary Moon solo album. Again, this is on Amazon <laughs> as well, called Thousand Bridges. Mm-hmm. And the title track is probably one of my favorite tracks that you have done. Um, and it might have a little bit of new life breathed into it as well. We'll talk about that later. But uh, you also do a kind of like a more original version of Feeding Off the Mojo, kind of like maybe how you had written it originally on this album. Yeah. Yeah, in a hotel room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on my little Ford track, Postex. So, after the Thousand Bridges, you kind of, you hinted at it earlier, Curly Smith comes calling you, you guys get back together and you do this band called the Hitmen All-Stars, had you, Curly Smith, um, from, like we said, Boston, and uh, JoJo Gunn, who else joined you with that project? Oh man, you're gonna do this to me. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, uh, it's because it, it's it's been a few years. I think. Uh, uh, and Brent, you may know this. Who was the uh, guitarist that replaced um, uh, Joe Perry? Jimmy Crespo. Yeah, Jimmy Crespo. I think he played a few dates with you guys. Um, yeah. And I think Steve and Jerry from Journey that replaced Steve Perry maybe sang a show or two with you guys. Yeah. So. Some- Sometimes uh, because it was a swinging door. Yeah. I mean, whoever was off tour and Kelly, I mean, not Kelly, but I would say Kelly. <laughs> Kelly, I love you, man. Um, Curly uh, has so many friends out there. There was a guy in um, uh, a couple of huge bands that were just taking some time off, talked them into come out and doing like a five or six dates of our tour. Mm-hmm. So we would have people in and out. Yeah, that's which made which made it interesting for the the people who are coming to see us. They go, Wow, did you hear that? It was like, so Yeah, because I saw like clips you guys would do like you know, Night Ranger tracks, Aerosmith, Boston. It was just and there's and it's a good uh it's a good formula. We've you know, Kelly Keggy did it with scrap metal. There mm-hmm. was a thing out in Vegas that I saw 10 years back called, I think, Monster Circus that had members of Motley Crue and Kiss and everything in there. And it's great because you get to you know, hear music from all the bands you enjoy and see the, the different members. So also, in the last few years, you've also did some shows with Mickey Free, correct? Yes. How did um, how did you guys hook up? I'm gonna have to take these buds out because they're not they're not working either. Okay. Uh, well, Curly, again, th- those guys have known each other for a long, long, long time, and um, and Mickey was trying to um, put a trio together uh, to promote lot of his music that he's mm-hmm. been doing and uh, um, and Curly called me would I be interested in doing a power trio with this guy named Mickey Free so they sent me out a couple CDs and it was like you know I'm playing with Hendrix here I mean yeah this, this guy's pretty prolific I mean uh, he just about do anything on that damn guitar I swear um, and I thought it would be a lot of fun because he covers a lot of basses on the guitar and I'm I just I just get to play as hard as I want with this guy, and Curly steps up to the game too, because you know he 
Curly's one of those uh, professional drummers that whatever the song needs, he'll put it in there. Um, he can play really hard. He can play with a lot of finesse. But uh, this Mickey Free project that we, uh, I think it was the first gig that I did with, with Mickey was in um, New Mexico. Um, nice big stage and everything. And it was our first time, first time together. We actually got to rehearse the day of the show so we could at least know that we're <laughs> on the same track. And, um, uh, man, it just, and just set it off. I mean, we, we're still friends too. I mean, uh, him and his wife and we converse all the time and, mm -hmm. and the memories and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of pictures on stage that sometimes I, I get in my memory, you know, this today's memory is, yeah. And there I'd be up there with Mickey. And uh, so and it was fun for, I don't know how long we did that. Um, I think, I think it was just maybe a year or two at the mm -hmm. most. And it was just a side project too. I mean, I, whenever there was something to, something to go to and play at, um, they would give me a call and say, are you free on this date? And I go, yeah. I said, well, come on out. Let's do it. So, now, Brent, you got a uh, Mickey Free question for Gary? Well, you see, my first exposure to Mickey Free was a band called Crown of Thorns he was in. With the Crown Jean Bouvlois. Yeah, with Jean Bouvlois. Yes, I know, I know what you're talking about. God, that, that, that was such a kick-ass band, and that guy... Well, one he he's the illustrated man. I mean, I mean, I believe he has tattoos all over his body. Right. Um, just phenomenal. I'd never heard of the guy until then, and it, it was shame because they they were big over in England or or semi big, I guess, in yeah. in Europe, and I and I never had a chance to see that band play. Mm. Would love to see that. I'd love to see you with him. My goodness, I had no idea that you played with him. Yeah, it was just like these special gigs that uh, it was always something very special and uh, almost big but private at the same time. I mean, he, he had a certain amount of fans, and Curly had fans too. And people knew about me, but yeah. never knew me being with Mickey or, or Curly at the time. So it was a new, what he called Mickey free experience. Um, and, uh, it was, I mean, I've very, been very lucky to play with some of the, these mm -hmm. incredible songwriters and players that, um, uh, you know, I'm counting my lucky stars, knocking on wood, wherever I go and staying in shape. Uh, I think I'm in better shape now than I was, 20 years ago uh, I can't wait to get on stage and mm -hmm. do my backflips and yeah. uh, crawl like an alligator you know <laughs> all that stuff and what's what's uh what's funny is with Mickey Free uh a lot of the younger generation probably knows the name Mickey Free from Shalimar right and the skit on the Dave Chappelle show where the Charlie Murphy stories he talks about hanging out with Prince and you know his brother Eddie Murphy, and Eddie, he mentions Eddie's with Shalimar and Mickey Free, and it's the episode where they're at the club, and they go back to Prince's house, and Prince is like, "Hey, in the middle of the night, let's play a game of basketball." So they give Charlie Murphy and Eddie Murphy and his entourage, uh, you know, like sports outfits, you know, you know, shorts and stuff. Yeah. And then Prince and Mickey Free and Shalimar, and they're, they all come out still wearing their club outfits, you know, the ruffles <laughs> yeah. and the, the, yeah. the heeled shoes. And uh, Charlie Murphy said they kicked their ass. You know, they were laughing <laughs> at him, but they kicked their ass. And uh, he goes, uh, he goes, at the end, Prince brought us in and made us pancakes. And, you know, they're, you know, the, whoever, like the interviewer or the skit is, you know, ask him, really? He goes, I'm not lying. He made his pancakes. 
And there is a, there is an interview out there with Mickey Free. They ask him about that night, and he guys he goes every part of it's true, and he goes into the details of it. But uh, yes, most of the younger generation, you mentioned Mickey Free, probably what they'll think of first is the Charlie Murphy stories from uh, the Dave Chappelle show. So in the last uh, year or so, Gary, you've uh, kind of been hooking up with your uh, old partner in crime, uh, Brad Gillis. Yeah. How how did uh, how did this all start kicking off again? Well, um, Brad uh, just out of the blue um, called me up and said. Sometimes he called me moon poopies. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he's going to hear this or not, but he'll probably uh, hate saying that. But, well, we uh, like to think Brad is an avid listener to the Fans yeah. in Motion podcast. So, all right. Well, anyway, you know, I, I was, I was, uh, you know, down in rank and called moon poopies, and he said, "You know what? I got, I got some ideas for songs. I like this." shoot some of them down to you because we were like 300, 400 miles away from each other and uh, tell me what you think and um, if you like anything, I'll send you he always sent me about maybe three three songs at a time and uh, I would come up with a melody an idea for what I wanted to uh, write the song uh, and he had ideas for what he'd like for the song to be about. He told me that too, eventually, and we kind of melded together. So he would send me songs like three or four at a time. I'd work on them for about two weeks. And then I'd fly up to his house in the studio. And uh, we spent five or six, seven days down there in the dungeon, just plowing out songs. And it was all off, off the cuff stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, was sometimes it? I'd be up for three days and all of a sudden some of the best shit that I ever came up with came out. Wow. <laughs> because, you know, sometimes you just, you have so much stuff going on in your life, but eventually it just drops off. And all of a sudden you're stuck with just your primitive self. And and some of the, some of these ideas just came right from the gut, you know, just and um, that's that's why I like working with Brad. He's, he's he likes to stretch out as far as he can, and he knows I do. Uh, and that's why we had such a great time on the Alligator record. We did the same thing with the Alligator record. Um, how we worked on the tunes and everything, but uh, but we started coming up with some great ideas for songs. So it, it, it just. We said, we got to finish this thing. So it wasn't that long ago, maybe just a couple months ago, that uh, we uh, we finished the record, and then Brad has been... Uh, and I came back home and was doing some more writing, and uh, he started doing these mixes, different mixes, and sending them to me. He said, what do you think about this mix, and that mix? And I uh, would make a couple comments here and there, but mostly, I mean, I didn't have to do anything to the songs. I mean, he's become pretty good at producing records and coming up with all these tricks, mm -hmm. you know, that he's learned throughout the years, being in some of the biggest studios in the world. Uh, and he just applied them to what we were doing, and all of a sudden it sounded huge. So I can't wait to get these songs out. I privately released a couple songs to some of my closest friends and they know not to uh, let anybody know about it, but I just wanted their perspective on what, what, what do you think about these songs and uh, from what I've been doing in the past and, uh, and they all just love it. They just can't wait for the record to come out. How many so, songs, right. how many songs do you guys have you, you guys recorded for the album? You know, I couldn't give you a straight number on that, but I think we probably had just under 20 songs. Um, some of them ended up shining and some of them we said, we just put on the side and see if we can come back to it later. And I think 
he's decided, and uh, we both decided that uh, I think that the 12 or 13 songs would be big enough for a record. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise you're going to have to do a double record, you know? Well, you just leave uh, some, of, uh, some of them off, and that'll give you an for opportunity the for, the, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. the next one there. <laughs> Uh, any uh, song titles you can tease us with? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> well, we know he he he. Brand himself has said one song title. Well, uh, sex for the money. Sex for the money, and that you recorded the video for that. And they did play on Rudy Sarzo's internet radio. They did play Gun for Hire. So yeah, well, that's all about Brad. He was a gun for hire. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I love putting that song together because I thought, you know, Brad's definitely one of those sharpshooter on the guitars. You know, I thought, you know, why don't we? Chicks on fire. I'm a gun for hire. You know, and it's all about him. You know, mm. burning his neck up on, on some of the stuff he does, and. Um, it was kind of a play on words, but I thought, what appropriate song to be about Brad. It's a gun for a hire. One of, um, yeah, go ahead. One of the uh, listeners to the podcast, and I unfortunately can't remember the name, but I remember the question, was, are there going to be any leftover Mojo era songs on the record? Hmm. No, I don't think so. These are all new things, mm -hmm. uh, except for Thousand Bridges, which Brad has always liked that song. And every time we used to get together with one of our friends down in Santa Cruz Mountains, we have a friend down there, Peter, who uh, Brad helped build a studio, and he's got a bunch of money, so it was like had the best studio down there. And we used to show up at these parties that would be a couple of days long and all these friends would come down there maybe maybe 30 people and uh we we jam and uh, all of a sudden we started you know what let's let's turn on the machine man and see if we can turn some of the stuff into something good you know so i had this song thousand bridges that brad has heard me play or he heard some, I, I think maybe uh, my friend down there in the Santa Cruz mountains, I think he had a copy of thousand bridges. He always loved it. And he begged me, is, is you mind if I put that on our record? I go, hell no. Are you kidding me? I mean, mm -hmm. like music box. I wrote that song back in the seventies, you know, when I first came out to California and it sounded like a music box. Um, the one that's on the thousand, is it Thousand Bridges? Uh, yes. Yeah, still Moon. Still Moon. Mm -hmm. um, it was set up to sound like a music box. And it was a true story, but, uh, you know, uh, me going on the road and, and um, buying a music box with the song that I wrote and turned it into the music box. And so she could play the song in the music box uh, on a rainy day, you know, looking out her window in her bedroom. And there was all this big vision that I saw. And I thought, you know, and everybody liked the song. So I think there's three versions out there. So, you, but, so, Brad, uh, so Brad asked you basically the title track off your second solo album. If they, you guys, so you guys are kind of re-recording it putting yep. a new touch on it and that'll be a uh, very uh very cool to uh to hear have you guys any release dates or anything yet or is that still being negotiated and in the works it's still being uh worked out i know that uh we're definitely we've had a couple offers from a couple of different record companies um uh, usually europe mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we want to get the best deal we can. And there's no hurry right now mm -hmm. because, yeah, you know, everything's kind of at a stagnant uh, standstill. So, 
I think we're just waiting for the right moment to get this thing out because it's different than anything anybody's heard Brad do or me. But when we get together, there's this magic thing that happens in these songs. Um, yeah. They're just, uh, it's like, uh, I don't know what to, what to call it, but there's this, uh, a certain chemistry that happens when we work together that we look at each other and we start like laughing. It's, it's so, so <laughs> happening. We're just going, what the fuck, man? I mean, well, hopefully this is, this is an ass kicking song. Let's put that on there too. And that, <laughs> so, and that all came from a tape that you had going around and them finding you, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, from back that, in you the... know, that synergy you're talking about, you know, they found you. And That's cool. And 38, 30 years later, you guys are still, uh, you know, creating great new music. Hopefully, you, was... when the album comes out, you guys uh, find yourself a uh, drummer. A uh, <laughs> well, that too, but you guys find yourself <laughs> a uh, drummer and do some shows out there. And uh, when the album does come out, uh, obviously, there's an open invitation for you, you and uh, Brad, obviously, to uh, come on and talk about it there's uh there's some great anticipation for that album to uh come out uh brent uh i want to i want to ask gary just randomly gary do you have any rubicon stories did you and rubicon ever cross paths back in the 70s yep there's only one Rubicon story, and it was, there used to be these clubs, there are two clubs, uh, like brother and sister clubs. One was up in San Francisco, and one was down in like around Pismo Beach, which is about halfway between LA and San Francisco. And it was, they were called C Street North and C Street South. And that's a, a big club that a lot of uh, recording artists if they were touring, they would, they would stop and play at that club. Um, and I was, I was, uh, doing the moon sparks thing and I was, uh, working, we were working our way up from Los Angeles. We came out all the way from Ohio and, uh, put this band together, moon sparks. And so we put the band together and we started going up, booking shows up the coast. Um, and when we got up to Pismo Beach, our keyboard player decided to quit. Uh, his girlfriend uh, started a hair salon in Vegas, and he goes, I need to go out there and help her put it together. So, okay, so you just go ahead and do that. And uh, and we found somebody right there in Pismo Beach uh, that just came in and played the hell out of a Hammond and just sat in with us one night and he's in and he was all in. So anyway, we're doing a show, getting ready to do a show at C street South, which was down there in Pismo and Rubicon was the other band that was playing that night. So it was just us two bands. So I remember my brother was in, in uh, Moonsparks too. So uh, Brad's guitar or his amp blew a fuse or something and it wasn't working uh, right before he was supposed to go on. And my brother turned him on to uh, Mesa Boogie or something. I'm not sure what the name of the amp was, but gave it to Brad to use for his show. So that's how we met. We were doing the Shows at the same club, never known each other for anything. Uh, and we hit it off. And, you know, that just happened. Then it just kind of dissolved into the air. And then when I finally got got into uh, knowing Brad the first time when we started putting the Night Ranger thing together, uh, I realized that he was the guitar player that night. And Rubicon and wow, 
<laughs> and we so man, and then we started talking about all kinds of crazy shit. I think there was a fight in the bar that night, and everybody was throwing chairs, and but the music <laughs> kept going. Music kept going. <laughs> you know? But it was one of those. It was right out of a movie. I mean, uh, about five or six different marshals and sheriffs came in and were tying people up to chairs. Uh, but the the show went on, and uh, so we. we that's one of the stories mm-hmm. that. Uh, that's just cool that your guys' paths crossed. I know that even that yeah. early. It was meant to be, I guess. So another uh, kind of wild. Out- left field question I got for you. Yeah. What was your favorite when you were, you know, touring with Night Ranger in the uh early to mid nineties, what was your favorite classic era Night Ranger song to play live? So not your era, but the uh classic era. Well the classic era. Now are you talking about live shows or uh it could be both. I was just I was just asking live on stage, what was what was the one track that you just really enjoyed playing from that previous line? Oh, when I was in the band. Yeah, from when you were in the band, but you know, you guys were playing some of the early er, right. early hits. Well, when you close your eyes, it was such a great song. Um, and Rock in America. I mean, there was about three, five songs in our set list that, because I was kind of making it my own too, you know. Um, I played pretty aggressively on, especially like Rock in America and Don't Tell Me You Love Me. Uh, and I, nothing really stands out. It was just like every song that we did was actually, I guess, not a hit, but. Uh, well-known songs mm-hmm. from the era of uh, Midnight Madness. Uh, I mean, that's that's where some of the biggest hits came from, Midnight Madness. And um, Sister Christian was always a lot of fun because Kelly got to come out in front of the, the audience and he would talk about uh, what the song was about, what inspired him to write the song, and then he just started almost like spoken word. He just started singing the melody and everybody just started to uh, come in on the song. And by the time we're about one third the way through the song, yeah, I'm trying to get rid of this guy. There you there go. You hey, there we are. Good job. Tell Brad to stop calling in. Yeah. What's, well, I think that's what it is. Um, but it's uh, Andy. It's Andy trying to get back on the show. You know that that song was was always the highlight of the night. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, I think we made it about ten minutes long, if not longer. And of course, whenever we did radio together, if we get Kelly, because Brad and I did most of the radio, but if Kelly would join us in the radio, we would always do that song. And I, I. I played acoustic guitar with Brad and it would just be the three of us singing. And, uh, and I heard I, I, the DJs were sending me tapes of the program that we did and, uh, sound is so good, man. I mean, they got so much compression on their, uh, their microphones and radio, yeah. as you know, right. That, uh, I don't think you can blow up a speaker. I mean, I'd, I'd put my voice 100% or 150% as loud as I could nail a vocal. And when I heard it back, I was nice and relaxed, but hitting all the notes. So, anyway. Brent? I just, sometimes the radio made me sound better. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> now, when you, you say you didn't know any songs by them, but when you joined the band... And you had to learn the songs. Did you say, oh, I've heard that before? It was, I mean, was there any of that? None. That, that's it. amazing. I mean, and, I and, and they had to kind of like that. Because well, there, there was a p- period of time um, since I left Ohio in the mid-70s 
and I had the moon sparks thing. We kind of had this thing that we were not going to do any cover songs. So we never even listened to the radio. I didn't want to be influenced by a song that I might like, and then I wanted to learn it. We just stayed true to the songs that we wrote. And so I did never heard of Night Ranger. Um, and so you never but, got sucked into watching MTV like every like the whole world did, just watching it all day long. No. Wow. No, it was just I started basically from scratch, and I think that they enjoyed that, uh, Brad and Kelly, and Jeff was with us in the very beginning too. Um. Uh, but it just for some reason. I had to make the song kind of my own a little bit because, you know, of course, I was starting to sing the leads uh, with Kelly, and uh, yep. and I'm going to sound different than, oh, of course, you know, just about anybody on, in the band because it, it was supposed to be different. It was supposed to be different, but whenever I was trying to sing, you know, the, the hits from Night Ranger that already made it, um, I tried as close as I could to match up. So the fans, you know, would, you know, wouldn't be set off by it. You know, who's this long-haired guy trying to trying to sing Jack? Come on, you know. No, I just <laughs> sung me. I just sung me. I never tried to imitate Jack at all because he has his own thing, and uh, that's great. I mean, come on, they did a lot together, and, and actually, I guess they're trying to do a new record right now. Yeah. So, but, Gary, what, um, what was the first concert that you ever saw? Okay, first concert I've ever saw mm -hmm. in my life. Yeah. I'll tell you who who it was. It was Led Zeppelin. They just came out they just came out with Led Zeppelin 2 and they were promoting a record and they were playing this uh, great show in Columbus, Ohio. Um and I was a huge fan. I just, I couldn't believe that someone got me tickets to it. And I sat in the second row. I mean, Robert Plant could just spit on me, you know. I think he did. <laughs> um, but that changed my life. That night changed my life. I go, this is what I want to do it. I want to do it this way, you know. I just want to blow people away and, uh, and, <laughs> Just laugh and spit on phone. people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I just, you know, make that smirk that uh, uh, Eddie Van Halen used to do when he played yeah. his solos. You know, he kind of do that cheesy smile while he was like kicking mucking ass on his guitar. And it was like, you, you think you're so great. <laughs> That's the way it came across. To me, but he was. You know, so there was no well, doubt about that. So, so I, I. I changed my whole attitude uh went back and started writing a whole different kind of songs and um and of course you know i saw uh, actually i saw jojo gunn uh, uh curly smith was in there was a band called uh, uh it was a really cheesy vocal band uh that he was doing a show there too and uh it was so weird all these all these especially now all these years that i've been touring a lot it's, it's so weird when you run across people especially if it was one of those three-day festivals and there's like 20 bands and they're all like they all had hit records and all of a sudden you're just sitting in a tent with kind of a mediocre cold beer uh, with your shoes off and and got 15 minute guys, uh, you know, and you just kind of have this camaraderie that, uh, that happens. And, uh, I just, I forgot what your question was. actually. <laughs> hey, Brent, you got a left field question. Well, the, it kind of goes back to when you joined night Ranger, since you didn't, you never heard them. What did you think the first time you heard Brad plug in? I mean, what were your impressions of his style and, because I mean, I mean, 
he didn't emulate anybody. He he was just his own guy. Right. Well, I tell you what, um, I don't think I've ever heard anybody because I was kind of in the fusion jazz for a long time. So John McLaughlin, yeah, and all these crazy ass players that I don't know how in the hell they got the sound out of that guitar, but uh, but uh, Brad was playing stuff that I've never heard before. You know, I was pretty impressed. I could see how this could be a fucking excuse my language a trio because he's covering a lot of bases and he's got a lot of tricks of the trade and and you know he looks good doing it. And so I was quite impressed. And in Kelly's drumming and his voice, you know, I, I couldn't believe that I got set in this big studio, that uh, rehearsal studio in North Hollywood, um, when they were looking for somebody to be a lead singer and a, and a bass player when they were just starting to put, put the band back together. I had to audition, actually. So I went in, met them, never seen them before. And I didn't know any of their songs. Uh, so they said, well, so you don't know any of her songs? I said, no, I don't. I just don't know any of your songs, man. And so how about if we play some blues? And I go, I'm, I'm there. I can definitely play some blues and sing. Said, and just sing whatever you want. Make up your own lyrics melodies, whatever, just put it all out there. So we did, after a couple songs, I was like, I was ripping it up, talking about how I actually got to the studio. Someone told me about them. I walked in and these two bright stars were there. I mean, it was a blues song, but it was all about how I got to that point. And they kind of liked that. And I was, I was able to do the screaming stuff and the, baritone stuff and gave him a little of everything and um, I think I think they had auditioned you know a bunch of guitar players before that that day I think and I was the last one and they just told me almost right then says if you're interested man we'd love to have you join us and I go wow <laughs> well I gotta think about this now I gotta uh, take care of my grandma no. <laughs> uh, but they said well I'll tell you what we'll, we'll give you a call in a few days or so and uh, we'll talk to our manager and uh, and have you come in for a meeting so that's when I, I met Camel and uh, mm -hmm. so I don't know what to say except uh, you know I was quite impressed and I, it, it, it actually made, made me a better player mm -hmm. because uh, you know, Brad was, you know, he was testing me on some of the stuff that he was playing. <laughs> Wanted to see if I can catch up with him kind of stuff, you know. Was... And I did. <laughs> so anyway, it was it was like a free-for-all, but uh, it turned out to be really good. And, and uh, I mean, that was a high, except, except for when I was with Three Dog Night, um, was the most highlight of my career. Of playing with them because you know when I was playing with Three Dog Night we were playing with the Beach Boys, the uh, Steppenwolf, uh, you know all these great bands that had hits out at that time. Mm -hmm. Grand Funk and Grand Funk, all that yeah. stuff. I mean, I, we did a show with Grand Funk in uh, in uh, New Jersey somewhere, and that was a great experience too. So anyway. It, uh, and of course, Night Ranger, Night Ranger we, we played some of the, the, the best bands around and until we could, uh, you know, be headliners, which we ended up doing. But I, yeah, man, I, it's, it's still one of the best things I ever did. And that's why Brad and I are still hooked, hooked <laughs> up because uh, you know, well, no you're lucky you guys clicked, you know, personality wise. I mean, not yeah. knowing each other. It's very fortunate. Yeah, it just almost had the same makeup or something, you know? Because uh, every time we'd get totally into a song and we'd take a break and we'd go out to a fire pit and sit and smoke a cigarette, have a beer or two, and and, uh, 
you know, this felt so natural, you know? So I, that's why I ended up staying there a couple extra days. And uh, he said, I got, you know, I have this song that I did like years ago, like 15 years ago. And I think I could find it. I bet this would be great for us to do. That's the kind of stuff he would do. He'd pull mm -hmm. out stuff that he already wanted to do, but never made, made it in the night ranger realm. Yeah. And, uh, so he was allowed to do whatever he wanted now, you know, because, you know, Jack kind of, you know, pretty much kind of running the ship. Uh, and a lot of the songs, you know, came from his, his ideas. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure this new record is going to be almost the same. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some great songs on there, but Brett, I know, is dying to break out with the solo thing. Mm hmm uh, he's he's so jazzed about the songs, and um, and I, I can't wait either. I mean that's cool. Here's... Everybody I run into, I make them sit in my car for fifteen minutes, <laughs> and I go, "What do you think of this, man?" <laughs> you know, here's a, like I was a teenager or something. Here's a question I'd like to ask to, uh, yeah. the songwriters. So let's say a hundred years from now, there's some. 13 year old kid doing a research project on his family tree and he sees that his great 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 grandpa was a person by the name of Gary Moon and that he was a songwriter so he starts trying to do some research through the family archives and you know all that stuff and through the stuff that we don't even know will exist then what is the one song of yours that you hope he discovers Well, um, when I was writing Thousand Bridges, are you guys with me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, good. I got my AirPods back in. Charged them up. Uh, you know, I was living up in Carmel at the time and recording songs. Uh, I mean, there's... Not with Night Ranger. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about songs with Night Ranger? I'm just no. Nope. Any song. Any song. What's Any the song. one song throughout your whole career you hope this great, 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 great grandchild? <laughs> and hopefully it's not like a scat demo or something that he finds. Hey, do you have kids, Gary? <laughs> do you have kids? I got. I got okay. One. Well, then this question will apply. Then <laughs> it will work. Yeah. <laughs> He's actually a really good drummer, and he has his own band called Awkward Talker. Um, and uh, you know, that's a great name. I know, I know. It's a great it, name. I had a lead singer that reminded me so much of uh, Mick Jagger. He'd like take his shirt off, and he was like a skinny guy, and uh, he got all weird and stuff, you know. Uh, Chris, my son, was back there just pounding like John Bonham and doing nice heavy fills. And uh, uh, so anyway, yeah, he's he's still trying to get that going, but because uh, he had to move out of our, our house of 30 years that we've lived in before I bought this house. And I said, man, you, you got to go on your own now. You have to go get an apartment. <laughs> And uh, you've got a new job now at a new health food store. And, uh, but now he's loving it. So he's loving being on his own and, and me not coming down on him every time he came home past midnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, his, his mom was worried, you know, and I, I, I get so pissed off that uh, I would go down and always have some kind of talk. And then it finally kind of got to the point where he would stop me. Dad, I don't want to hear it. I know what you're going to say. Just go to bed. <laughs> okay. So that's what happened. You said, if you're on your own, you can live on your own. How about that? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he's, he's uh, going to join us up here for Christmas and uh, be one happy big family. So. So uh, what's what's the song, Gary? I'm putting you back up. I'm putting I'm putting you on the point, buddy. You're not getting out of it. I know. I, th I put you on a back road there. 
Um, I think well, there was this one song that's on uh, Thousand Bridges. Angels Don't Lie. Uh, it's all about the first trip that I ever took from Carmel to Big Sur, California, which is about 30, 45 minute cruise. And the first time, I mean, everybody said, oh, you got to go to Big Sur. You got to go to Big Sur. And I go, you know, I'm going to go down to Big Sur. And I, I actually took some um, magic mushrooms that somebody gave me a long time ago. And I thought, this is perfect. This is going to be this great. I want to be in a whole different mindset, you know. So I made some brownies and ate some of those mushrooms. And it never got really crazy, but uh, it just took me out of my myself. And I was watching myself driving down the coast, all these windy roads and beautiful. It felt like I was in Scotland. The ocean looked fantastic. And uh, when I got down to the River Inn, which is the beginning of Big Sur, I pulled over and they have a big ba- out patio and they have like a water running in a creek and you could sit on these big chairs in the water. And I went out there with the pad and I wrote the whole story of driving down to Big Sur. It was like, I was on my way down the road to the Big South, which means Big Sur. Just running away, lonely days, gonna find out, dreams are about, you know, and I just kept putting words to it. I didn't even have to think about it. They were just coming out. But it's just this one, this one song that I don't think I ever had to do any research or nothing. It was just things were just coming out on paper. That song, which a lot of people haven't heard because they haven't had that record, uh, Besides that, Music Box was always like, Music Box was a song that that uh, Don Grierson, when he was working with uh, Drive Entertainment, when we first got our deal, uh, he came to rehearsal and we played a couple songs for him so he'd get an idea of what we're trying to sound like. And when we played Thousand Bridges, I mean, not Thousand Bridges, I'm music sorry, box. but uh, Music Box, Afterwards, he just stood up and said, now that's a hit. I go, damn, really? Well, that's nice. I wrote this song back in the 70s. And you can get... yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that that we made it our own. I mean, uh, everybody just... the, The heart of the song was always there, and the lyrics were such a great story that he just thought, you know, this, this song came from somebody's heart. Mm. And, um, and anytime everybody, anybody said, where, where can I find your music? Where can I find your music all the time? I get that all the time. I go, well, you just Google me. Uh, there's a couple of records out there. You can check me out. Uh, <laughs> but if you Google Gary Moon music box, uh, you can go there and download that song and it seems like that song has impressed more people than any song that I've ever written. So, And the anyway. uh, Angels Don't Lie, the first track you were talking about, is yeah. is on Still Moon, as is the that original version of Music Box. So, And you can get both of those on Amazon. They're also, both of those albums are on Amazon. Uh, not Amazon. Um, no, Amazon. Uh, if you got the unlimited, both of those albums are are on there. Brent, you got a uh, final question you want to ask the Moon Man? <laughs> no, you pretty much um, just said blowing me away sitting here listening to your stories. I love this. I love hearing <laughs> things that I don't. Some things I do know about. And then when you keep, when, when, when we when we let you go, it's beautiful. Well, it's... you know, these are periods of time uh, that uh, 
they're going to be with me forever because sure they they were uh, they that all made me what I am right now and uh, I mean I'm just putting together a a band up here uh, a drummer that I've known for years and years and years since the 70s His name is Jamie D Maria um, and he's got uh, his great keyboard player that plays a moog and uh, piano and Hammond and all that kind of stuff and uh, we're looking for a guitar player but uh, just the drums and this keyboard player and myself we've been getting together and going through my whole catalog really stuff really? that I did with with Night Ranger uh, the Still Moon CD Thousand Bridges and uh, anything else well, even we're throwing in a couple uh, Three Dog Night songs, you know, like uh, Joy to the World and uh, um, Liar. It's a song called Liar. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so it's a it's mixed, eclectic uh, show. Because, I mean, I'm, I just, I live here now. They all live like 10 minutes away from me. So why don't we mm-hmm. have this band and we can just go out and play anywhere? You know, we we can actually do a gig in Vegas if you want. Uh, you know, I just I gotta keep playing. I gotta keep playing, and uh, there's so much I can do with me sitting here with my acoustic guitar. Um, well, it sounds like a good opportunity to uh, try to, new stuff. To maybe get a another solo record fit in there somewhere and do some and live he, shows. And he just said the title of it. I gotta keep playing. Yeah, I gotta keep that, playing. That, that's a great uh, yeah. title, and uh, and it sounds yeah. like uh, when the pandemic's over and you guys are uh, putting some shows together, that the uh, fans in motion podcast may need to need to take a road trip out west to uh, yeah to uh, yeah. check all this stuff out. Gary, I'm Casa gonna... de Moon, yeah, <laughs> Casa Luna. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Gary, I'm going to leave you with this question. I, I'm, and I, I ask it to others, and it's probably the most appropriate to ask it of you. Um, oh, it's not about the magic mushrooms. Well, no, we're going to ask what's, that that off what air. Side, what's, what side I hang on? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we we've seen you stand up enough. I think we know now. <laughs> okay, but, uh, all right. Uh, my my question is, and it's not, uh, is uh, Gary, where were you July 20th, 1969, when man landed on the moon? <laughs> you ask most people these questions? I do. It's, because it's always an interesting answer. I He's going to say women landed on the moon in 1969. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know what I was doing in 1969. That was, uh, I graduated from high school. Yeah. Um, and I was in the only rock and roll band in my school. And I, I remember seeing that, that whole program where they, they showed the walking on the moon and everything. And it was like, and what a crazy, magical time right now. And with the last name Moon, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I, maybe I can use that landing on the moon thing as a little promotional tool that I can use down the road. You know, I, the man in the moon, I got like this one picture someone painted. It's a famous painter. It's called Man in the Moon, and, and it's like this uh, clown character. And I always thought, well, that's me, you know. <laughs> but uh yeah you know i was i was just starting to write uh my own stuff right then this it was right right before i i joined this uh seven piece horn band uh london fog and the continentals it was an all black band and uh they used to play in this one club in my hometown they were really good they had a they had a record out and um, this one Saturday night, they were having anybody that wanted to come up and sing a song kind of thing. And I was with my football buddies, and they just said, Moon, get up there, man, get up there, sing. So I said, what can I do with a seven-piece horn band? Well, you know, I picked out a song that doesn't even have horns in it, but 
<laughs> Dock of the Bay by Otis Redding. Sitting on the dock of the bay, you know. And I got down on my knees and I leaned back. I, I did a couple spins and I directed the band, act like I was directing them. I never even seen them before. Uh, so the manager was this uh, big white woman that uh, was their manager, I guess. She came up to my table and with my guys sitting there said, would you be interested in ever going out on tour with a band like us? And I go, well, I don't know. I mean, well, I'll tell you what, you think about it. I could pay you this much money and we're starting, we're going out promoting this record that we did, did, excuse me. And, uh, you would be perfect because we're looking for a blue eyed soul singer. That's what they called me. Like a white guy that sings black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blue eyed soul, uh, which is, I, I was, you know, compliment. I mean, I, I loved singing James Brown and Wilson Pickett and all that, all of that stuff. I was totally into Motown at the time. And says, if, you, if you're interested, we're leaving in three weeks. If you're interested. And by the way, do you play horn? I go, yeah, yeah, I do. Never played a horn in my life. Uh, yeah, I play horn, um, saxophone. I said, well, that's great because, you know, you need to play a horn to do this with us. Because what you're going to do is you're going to be the lead singer with the band. Uh, there's going to be five sets. Two middle sets are going to be with the Continentals, which was like these trio of um, two black guys and a black girl. And they do like uh, the temptation moves and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they were the main part of the band, you know, the Continentals special. You know, I would warm up the audience with the first set. Uh, then I'd play horn back of the Continentals. And then I'd come back in a middle set third set would be me again being lead singer uh then i go back in the horn so i had to learn how to play horn so i had to go buy a selmer um tenor sax and there were the, the saxophone player in the band took me aside showed me how to finger it, you know so i could at least get my fingers on the right notes and uh, all the parts that i'd be do doing uh, off the bat was like, bop, bam, ba -da -da -da, you know, stuff like that. So I didn't have to do solo or anything like that. I just had to do those jabs. So it was pretty easy for me. And so I, 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 I was good. And we went out and toured for, I don't know, a couple of years. Um, <laughs> that's how I learned how to, how to spin, do the splits, do black flips, kick the microstone, you, you out, uh, James Brown used to kick the microphone yeah. stand over and he kicked it back with a Come split. back up. Come back up and do a spin and hi, you know. So I learned all that stuff during that time. So I, I became a blue-eyed soul singer, you know. And, um, but. Uh, London Fog anyway. and the Continentals. Yeah. Gary, I think that's where we're going to end it at okay. right there because I don't think we, <laughs> wow. can, we can top that. But, uh, Gary, thank you for coming on and joining us. Yeah, sure. Um, open invitation to come back when the uh, you and Brad's album is released. Down the road, yeah. we'd love to have you come back on and, and do an in-depth album dive of the uh, Mojo record where we talk about you know all the songs and just basically how they were written. But... Uh, Hey, we appreciate you coming on and uh, and giving the fans uh, what they want. We appreciate it. Anytime, man. I, it's a blast. You know, uh, I, you know, anytime I, because I'm one of those kind of guys that, uh, oh no, here comes Gary. Act like you don't see him. You know, in a bar, be my best buddies. They go, oh no, here comes Gary. I know what's going to happen. He's going to sit down, going to order a beer, and he's going to tell stories. <laughs> Well, yeah, Brad, Brad calls me poopy. What do he call you? Moon poopy. Moon poopies. Moon poopies, <laughs> yeah. 
There moon we poopies. And with Some that, bitch called me moon poopies today. <laughs> we're going to leave it with moon poopies later, everyone. <laughs> everybody how was that that was part three of the gary moon trilogy i guess we can call it for now although i think gary is going to become a friend of the show like our friend eric levy and uh, hopefully we'll have him back um josh you want to everybody you know, like the show go to subscribe um at uh, youtube I just totally screwed all that up. Yeah, you did. It was all right. I lost my train of thought. Go, I Josh, do you want to... Go, go to, like go to Face Space and... and go uh, to MySpace and put me at your top ten. And, yeah, so listen, and we have... Go to that uh, tube thing. Go to Facebook, Fans of Motion, uh, just Fans of Motion Night Ranger. You'll find us there. Obviously, everything kind of flows through the Facebook page and the YouTube is where we put most of the interview, all the interviews... And we always have photos and all that good stuff. Uh, you can find all the uh, podcasts on fansofmotion.com. If you go there, you can also find us on iHeartRadio, iTunes, uh, Spotify, uh, whatever, Amazon, Forever. all that stuff. And we just got approved for uh, Pandora after two months so i will get that working so you'll be able to listen to us on pandora so if you you know like the facebook page subscribe to the uh, youtube page and if you got you know leave us a comment on the youtube page or on the uh, facebook anything if you got what your thoughts are if you got photos from when you saw them back in the gary moon era you know take some you know you don't have to scan them or anything. Just take the, get, dig them out of the old photography book and and yeah. just take them a picture Snap of them. Yep, and just upload it. So that's what video. I'll be doing next. <laughs> yeah, so there's love your great to see some video footage from that tour. Yeah, I posted the only video footage that I can't remember if we talked about this in the beginning or not, but uh, 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 the only video footage that is really known to exist is the 1991 radio show from Houston. It's like a two-hour video. Night Ranger, I think, begins at the 1725 mark. I've posted to our page, the Facebook page. So they play three songs, Heart of Stone, uh, Wrong Again, and Don't Tell Me You Love Me. And at the end, Don't Tell, you, Don't Tell Me You Love Me, Jeff Watson comes out and performs with them. So a little Well, reading. that is super awesome. Um, Brent, you got anything you want to say before we sign off? Yeah, I'm normally like the um, teller to pen <laughs> in this part of the episode where I just don't say anything and just kind of move my head Not around and look at Josh. And, you know, sometimes, I, you know, the, the beauty about watching me instead of listening to me, I can I can I can sex you up on the camera like this. You know? Oh, boy. OK. But if but if you're listening to it on just in your earbuds, you know, I can really, really get sultry if I want to. Oh, Roger, boy. Roger Saltry, that is. There are women all over the country drying up right now. <laughs> I, I I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. All right, Andrew, take us out, my friend. Everybody, thank you so much. If you're still listening, please That's come to the page. That's what happens when you give me a chance to talk. Like us, ignore us, whatever, but uh, comment whether you like the show or what you don't like about the show. I'm Andy. That's Josh. That's Brent. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs> Mojo Mojo Mojo